Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another documentary by MTA International Australia Studios. Today we are taking our viewers on a tour of Melbourne in Australia. Melbourne is Australia's second largest city and is known for its cultural, food and sports heritage. We will endeavour to show you the key aspects of this gleaming city and its historical importance to the development of Australia as a nation. We will begin by visiting Eureka Sky Deck to take a bird's eye view of the city and the key places of interest we will visit today. Melbourne CBD compared with other Australian cities has comparatively unrestricted height limits and as a result of waves of post-war development contains five of the six tallest buildings in Australia, the tallest of which is the Eureka Tower. The Eureka Tower stands at 297 metres in height and was named after the Eureka Stockade, a rebellion during the Victorian Gold Rush in 1854. This has been incorporated into the design with the building's gold crown representing the gold rush and red stripe representing the blood spilt during the revolt, the blue glass cladding and white lines representing the blue and white flag of the Eureka Stockade. Completed in 2006, the Eureka Tower has an observation deck which commands excellent views in all directions across Melbourne. Visitors to the Eureka Sky Deck can see above all of Melbourne's key areas such as Port Phillip Bay and surrounding areas such as St Kilda and Albert Park, Altona to the west, the Yarra River, Central Business District and northern lying suburban areas and the world-class Melbourne Cricket Ground and surrounding sports precinct. Visitors can also experience stunning 360-degree night views of the city, showcasing the vivid lighting installations on various landmarks before returning from the 88th floor of the building to ground level. Federation Square is the size of a city block, or 38,000 square metres, and is built on top of a working railway. Unlike traditional public spaces like San Marco in Venice or New York's Rockefeller Centre, Federation Square is made up of a series of interlocking and cascading spaces. Buildings open at all angles into the city, creating unexpected connections and vistas. The design was heavily influenced by the idea of Federation, of bringing separate parts together to form a coherent whole. Over the last 200 years, the site has been home to the city morgue, a fish market, corporate offices and a rail yard. While planners had long dreamed of linking the CBD with the Yarra River, the divide created by the old railway yards had consistently thwart further development. In 1996, the Victorian government held an international design competition to redevelop the precinct as the city's new civic square, opening up the space for public use. The project had to include cultural and commercial buildings and an open amphitheatre capable of holding up to 15,000 people. One of Melbourne's grandest public buildings, the Parliament of Victoria, is located in the position terminating the long vista up Burke Street. The early date and monumental scale of the design indicates the huge aspirations of the young colony. From 1901 to 1927, Parliament House was the home of the Commonwealth Parliament, since the new capital city, Canberra, did not exist. During these years, the Victorian Parliament met in the Royal Exhibition Building in Carlton. The craftsmanship and detailing throughout the building is of extraordinarily high quality, and the interiors are spectacular. In particular, the plush upper house, one of the finest spaces built in the 19th century Australia. The north and south wings have never been completed, nor has the large dome, the most well-known architectural statement in Melbourne, never to be materialised. The Royal Exhibition Building was completed in 1880. It was built to host the Melbourne International Exhibition and later hosted the opening of the first Parliament of Australia in 1901. Throughout the 20th century, smaller sections and wings of the buildings were subject to demolition and fire. 
However, the main building, known as the Great Hall, survived. It received restoration throughout the 1990s and in 2004 became the first building in Australia to be awarded UNESCO's World Heritage status, being one of the last remaining major 19th century exhibition buildings in the world. It sits adjacent to the Melbourne Museum and is the largest item in the Museum Victoria's collection. Today the building hosts various exhibitions and other events and is closely tied with events in the Melbourne Museum. Melbourne's central station on Flinders Street was the result of decades of planning and years of building work. It was also a symbol of Melbourne's importance as a city. In 1899, a worldwide public competition was held to design a new station facade. On the 22nd of May 1900, the first prize was awarded to J.W. Fawcett and H.P.C. Ashworth, two Victorian Railways officials. Their Edwardian Borku design named Greenlight, had three storeys and included a giant dome clock tower. It also allowed for the growth of the station as well as the recreational facilities. Work on the foundations using pick shovels and wheelbarrows started in 1901. By 1906 the dome was being built. The station included platform canopies, was essentially completed by January 1910. The station housed the administration of the Metropolitan Railway. But the station was built as more than a station and contains rooms for public and commercial use. There were a number of different plans in the 1960s and 1970s to demolish the station and replace it with something more modern. However, Victorians fought to save their much-loved station. The station is registered under the Victorian Heritage Act. It is also listed by the National Trust. The Melbourne Tramway Network is a major form of public transport in Melbourne. The network consists of 250 kilometres of track, 487 trams, 28 routes, 1,773 tram stops. It is one of the largest urban tramway networks in the world, ahead of the networks in St. Petersburg, Berlin, Moscow and Vienna. Trams are a distinct part of Melbourne's character and feature in tourism and travel advertising. With a total of 182 million passenger trips per year, they are the second most used form of public transport in Melbourne after the main commuter railway network. The renowned Melbourne Sports and Entertainment Precinct is just 3 kilometres from the CBD and plays host to a major international and domestic sporting events. The sports precinct is easily accessible from the CBD by tram or bus and is within five minute journey. The precinct includes the world famous Melbourne Cricket Ground which hosted the 1956 Summer Olympic Games and 2006 Commonwealth Games. Located nearby is the Rod Laver Arena which hosts the Australian Open Tennis Tournament. First held in 1905 the tournament is chronologically the first of the four Grand Slam tennis events of the year. The newly constructed and award-winning Amy Park has a capacity of 30,000 spectators. Construction was completed in May 2012 using cutting-edge bio-frame design with dome roof. This method of construction allows spectators to enjoy undercover seating areas without any obstruction of views to the playing area. The stadium is used for rugby league and football games and was built to accommodate these growing sports in the region. The exterior of the stadium is covered in thousands of LED lights which can be programmed to display a variety of patterns and images. The Melbourne Cricket Ground or the MCG is a sports stadium located in Yarra Park and is home to the Melbourne Cricket Club. Following redevelopments the ground has a maximum seating capacity of just over 100,000 people. This makes it the eighth largest stadium in the world, the largest in Australia, and the largest stadium for playing cricket. 
The MCG is within walking distance of the city centre and is serviced by railway as well. The long history of the MCG stretches back to 1853, when the Melbourne Cricket Club selected the current site after playing at several other grounds around Melbourne. The first stand was built in 1854 for members. This was followed by the public grandstand in 1876, also known as the reversible stand. In 1881, the much larger Members Pavilion 2 was built, followed by other stands over the next few years. In 1912, the Wardle Stand was built to seat 6,000 spectators. In 1928, the first Brick Members Pavilion was built, regarded as the finest cricket facility at the time. The Southern Stand in 1936 replaced the Wardle Stand, which had a monumental capacity of 48,000. The stadium was used in the World War to house up to 200,000 troops before the Northern Stand was built prior to the Olympics being held in Melbourne, 1956. This was the first major event that brought the MCG its true international status. Many years later, in 1885, Lighting was introduced to hold night events. The Southern Stand was further developed in 1992 to accommodate 44,500 spectators and corporate clients. The northern side of the stadium underwent major reconstruction prior to the 2006 Commonwealth Games. Well, we're standing in front of the old reversible stand, constructed in 1877, to primarily overcome the concerns that the cricket fraternity had about playing football on their cricket ground, which would perhaps interfere with the sufficient growth of grass to enable a good turf wicket to be prepared. The way in which it was initially overcome was that, that we would have a football field here, we would have a cricket field here, and we would have the reversible stand in the middle. During the football season, the seats would face this way, during the cricket season, it would be twisted over and face that way. In 1877, of course, there were no electric motors, hydraulic rams, etc. It was all done with ropes and pulleys. It took about a day to transfer the seats, primarily because the backrests had to be removed and replaced from one side of the seating to the other side of the seating. And down here, we have a photograph showing both gowns, one down in this corner and the other one up in the diagonally opposite corner. And a more detailed photograph is shown here of one side of the ground up above this model. Unfortunately, the stand lasted only seven years, being burnt down in 1884. The MCG has always been at the forefront of contemporary technology. The stadium has seen lighting towers installed in 1985 to facilitate night sports. The MCG holds a world record for the highest light towers at any sporting venue at 85 metres in height. Each light tower has 140 lamps within the head frame. The arena profile was rebuilt to provide superior drainage and wear resistant surface, accommodating up to 90 event days annually. The MCG boasts two large video screens which are used to display scores and video replays of sports events and various announcements. Supplementing these large screens are parapet scoreboards which display a quick summary and screens located within the stadium indoor areas providing updates on the event's progress. Fence-mounted scrolling signage and media facilities including a TV studio are other advanced features of today's MCG. Considering the extensive history of the MCG, the MCC Museum was established to trace the rich history of one of the world's biggest sporting clubs. The museum documents and displays the people and the events of the past that have helped establish the MCG's status as an international sporting icon. The MCC collection boasts an astonishing array of artefacts, photographs, artworks associated with the club, the sports it fosters and the ground it has managed since 1853. It is a museum of many treasures dating back to the 18th century. The National Sports Museum exhibits the Australian Hall of Fame. The display lists many popular and successful Australian sportsmen of the past. In particular, the museum pays due respects to the great Sir Donald Bradman, whose cricketing legend needs little explanation.
The museum exhibits a statue of Sir Donald Bradman, as well as his baggy green cap, worn during the Test match in 1946 to 1947 Test season. During the war in 1942, Australia was increasingly concerned by the threat of the Japanese, and few were surprised when the ground was taken over by the Commonwealth Government on April 3, 1942. The MCG played an important part as it was close to transport. It provided undercover accommodation for about 200,000 Australian and American servicemen during the remaining years of the war. We hope our viewers enjoyed seeing the sights of Melbourne and encourage everyone to visit and experience firsthand the history and heritage of Melbourne. We look forward to bringing you another MTA International Australia Studios program very soon. Assalamu alaikum.